Prophet Sallallahu that whoever calls to nationalism, to tribalism, is not of us, not a true Muslim. So Allah puts it on the same level. There is nothing special about people's colors because it exists everywhere. In fact, it is all from the greatness of Allah's creation. Furthermore, when we even look at the issues of race and distinction that people try to make with race, what we find is that Allah has left in our midst a sign to us that we are in fact one regardless of what we look like on the outside. Reality is that if a person from the north of Europe, the whitest of white, is ill and they need a blood transfusion and they are O negative. The rest of his family is O positive. His community, there is no O negatives there. The blood of his own family and his community can't save his life. However, somebody who may be the blackest of black from the south of India, that person who looks the complete opposite of that person from the north of Europe, whitest of white, but that person from the south of India, blackest of black, who is O negative, his blood can save that man's life. Is this not a sign from God? Is this not an obvious sign for our times? Obviously before this it wasn't known, before the issues of blood transfusion, this was not an issue. Nobody knew about this sign. Because before that time, this sign wasn't relevant, wasn't important. But for our times, where science is what we use to determine right and wrong, here is the sign Allah has left in our own bodies. As He said, within yourselves the signs are there if you seek it. So Allah has left within us that sign to confirm to us that we are one human race. We are one human race. Islam in practice has always taught that. It has always conveyed that message to humankind. Because one may say, okay, the Quran doesn't speak about race and superiority, etc. But what about Muslims in history? from the first generations on down. What we find is, in fact, from among the Prophet's closest companions, people of varying backgrounds. Bilal, after whom my name comes. Bilal was an Abyssinian slave who was tortured. And he became a Muslim whilst he was a slave. Later he was freed. The Prophet elevated him elevated him, had him climb on top of the Kaaba and make the call to prayer. And he was known as the caller to prayer of the Prophet. Furthermore, the Prophet, he had a slave who was given to him by his wife, by the name of Zayd ibn al-Haritha. And he was dark complexioned also black. This slave who was with him, lived in the house with him, was treated so well, so fairly, so lovingly and so kindly that when his father tracked him down because he had been captured and put into slavery, and his father finally tracked him down and came to the Prophet ﷺ and asked the Prophet ﷺ if he could buy him back, buy back his freedom. The Prophet ﷺ said, take him. Take him. You don't have to pay for him. Take him. And of course, when the son, Zayd ibn al-Haritha, had uh, found his father, he was overjoyed 
to have found his father. And they both wept in joy to having met each other again after so many years. So when the father told him, okay, son, come with me. Let us go now. Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, he said, you can go with me. And he was a non-Muslim. Zaid said to him, no, no, father, I would prefer to stay with the prophet. Father was aghast. What? You would prefer to remain a slave in this man's household than come with your own father? He said, yes. The father said, obviously, he must be treating you like a father. And truly he was. When the father left him, knowing that he was in good hands, Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, freed him. This was the obvious outward technical freedom, but already he was free in his house. He just hadn't thought about it as an issue. So when it became an issue, he said, you're free. He declared his freedom. Not only did he declare his freedom, he adopted him as his own son. Can we have a better example? Can we have a better example of a complete lack of racism? That was the example of Prophet Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be upon him. And he made his son, Zaid's son, Usama ibn Zaid, he made him a general over the armies of the Muslims. While he was still a teenager, having under his command the caliphs, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman and Ali were under his command. Can we have a better example? This is the example of the Prophet. May God's peace and blessings be upon him. And we find in the generations that came after him the same attitude. After the Prophet died, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, and issues arose in Arabia. While Abu Bakr was the first caliph leading the Muslims, and people started to grumble about Usama being the leader of the army because he was young actually they weren't arguing about or grumbling about the fact that he was black it was about the fact that he was only about 17 years old this is young but abu Bakr said i would not change anyone who has been appointed by the prophet he wouldn't touch it and during the caliphate of Umar ibn al-Khattab, after him, the second caliph, his own son, Abdullah ibn Umar, questioned him why he was giving a higher salary to Usama ibn Zayd than to his own son, Abdullah. Why? So, Umar answered what? Umar said, radiallahu anhu, my son, I do so because I know well that Allah's Messenger loved Usama's father more than he loved your father. You hear that? Because I know well that Allah's Messenger loved Usama's father, that's Zayd ibn Haritha. He loved him more than he loved me your father and he loved Usama more than he loved you so Omar ibn al-Khattab didn't consider for a moment any change in the status which Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had afforded Zayd ibn al-Haritha and his son Usama ibn Zayd and on one occasion, when uh, people were speaking about Bilal, he said, Bilal, this is Omar ibn al-Khattab again, speaking about Bilal ibn Rabah. 
saying, Bilal is our master. And he was emancipated by our master Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr is the one, first caliph, who freed him. And he referred to him as Bilal is our master. He didn't hesitate to do that. But let me say at the same time that the companions of the Prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, were human beings. And there were a rare few occasions when some of them did express some prejudice in this regard. And on one occasion, Abu Dhar ibn al Ghaffari, who the Prophet ﷺ promised would be among the people of paradise. Abu Dhar, in a fit of anger, he called Bilal in a negative sense, you son of a black woman. In a negative sense, he was the son of a black woman, in reality. But he used the terms in a negative sense. When the Prophet ﷺ heard that, he turned to Abu Dhar and said, Anta rajulun fikal jahiliya. You are a man in whom the beliefs of the time of ignorance remains. There is ignorance in you. And he was very angry. These are the times when the Prophet ﷺ was angry. And it was visible in his face. Anger over injustice. So when Abu Dhar realized that, realized the error, because these things happen, comes out of people's mouths without thinking, he immediately put his head on the ground in front of Bilal and said, I will not lift my head until you walk over it. And in those days, one might say, what's the big deal about walking over somebody's head? This was a symbol of humility. You have been humbled so much so that your master, those who are over you, walk over your head. Bilal said, no, no, it's okay. No, it's all right. You know, I know you have made the error and you are repentant. You know, I don't hold you for it. You don't have to do that. Please don't. In fact, Bilal refused to step over his head. Abu Dhar refused. He said, by Allah, I'm not going to lift my head until you step over it. Meaning, if you don't, I'm going to be lying here for God knows how long. So in order to relieve him of that guilt, to help him relieve himself of the guilt, Bilal walked over his head. This happened among the companions of the Prophet. May God's peace and blessing be upon him. Our children at school, are they really getting the right education that prepares them to be the leaders of the Ummah? Who is responsible for deciding their future? Is it the parents? Is it the teachers? Or is it the whole Ummah? Should they have a say about the quality of their education? Does the current school environment have a positive or negative impact on them? To know about the right educational setup, watch my program, Our Children at School, only on Peace TV. Let's propose, promote, and preserve to make our kids real successful in this world and the hereafter. Join Dr. Mamdou Muhammad in Our Children at School every Saturday at 4 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 5 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Who was the first prophet? Was a prophet the first one to read and write? Did God speak to a prophet? A prophet in a prison. A prophet who commanded the birds, insects, and animals? Want to know more? Join us for Stories of the Prophets. Stories of the Prophets, every Monday at 7.30 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 8.30 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Peace TV presents. We pray to Allah that may he make this Dubai International Peace Convention 
larger and bigger every time. The philosophy for real peace. Listen to the words of Allah. Every word in the Quran is perfect. This is the message of Allah which He wanted us to communicate to the whole world. Pure, pragmatic, perfect. The Muslims that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for the humanity respond in a way that is best. best. Its basis to promote infallible teachings, righteous principles. Islam, it means peace. Worship none but him. You will be at peace. True values. Each and every Muslim, you have to obey the commandments of Allah. To create a society free from chaos. My mission of life is peace in every home. Know the greatness of simple and successful living in Islam in Vogue, next on Peace TV. In the generations to come, what we find is a variety of examples when we look at the great scholars of Islam. Those who studied under the companions of the Prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, known as the Tabi'un. Many of them were former slaves who were black. Slaves from varying other backgrounds, non-Arabs. And they were narrators of the traditions of the Prophet They were the teachers of Abu Hanifa, the teachers of Imam Malik, the teachers of Ahmed ibn Hanbal and al-Shafi'i, the great scholars of Islam. They were their teachers, and they were their students, and on down through the generations. And this is how Islam has been. It showed practically that there really is no superiority based on color or race. The leading scholars of Hadith for anyone who studies the science of hadith, which is the second most noble science after the sciences of the Quran for any Muslim to study. The leading narrators, compilers of hadith were non-Arabs. Ibn Majah, and Nasai, Al-Bukhari, and so on and so forth were non-Arabs. And this has been the tradition. And we can find in our times people seeing that and being moved by that to become Muslims. For example, in the statements of Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali, formerly known as Cassius Clay, the boxer from America, he said, the pilgrimage to Mecca was an exhilarating experience to see people belonging to different colors, races, and nationalities. Kings, heads of states, and ordinary men from very poor countries all clad in two simple white sheets, praying to God without any sense of either pride or inferiority. It was a practical manifestation of the concept of equality in Islam. And after him, Malcolm X, actually before him, Malcolm X, he had observed the same thing when he went on Hajj. He came back saying, never have I witnessed such sincere hospitality and the overwhelming spirit of true brotherhood as is practiced by people of all colors and races here in this ancient holy land. The home of Abraham, Muhammad, and all of the prophets of the Holy Scriptures. For the past week, I have been utterly speechless and spellbound by the graciousness I see displayed all around me by people of all colors. And when he returned to America and the press met him and asked him about his opinions, his changes that have taken place, if there were any changes in his views, he said one of the key factors that he said was that I can see that the only solution for racism in America is Islam. The only solution for racism, and he's speaking about America but it was worldwide, is Islam. Because Christianity had a tradition in America of black churches and white churches. 
And even in the white churches which allowed blacks, they would have to be in the back, somewhere off, you know, not sitting with the white people. This was their tradition, as in South Africa and elsewhere. So even in the religion, Christian religion had no basis in its teachings to deal with this sickness, this disease of racism. We also find from India, Gandhi himself saying, the Europeans in South Africa dread the advent of Islam as they, Muslims, claim equality with the white races. They may well dread it if brotherhood is a sin, if it is equality of the colored races that they dread, then their dread is well founded because that's what Islam calls to. We also have one of the Indian freedom fighters, a female by the name of Sarojini Naidu. She said, I have been struck over and over again by this indivisible unity of Islam that makes a man instinctively a brother. When you meet an Egyptian, an Algerian, an Indian, and a Turk in London, what matters is that Egypt is the motherland of one and India is the motherland of another. That's all. They are one. So these are the observations of those who have looked at Islam from the outside as well as from within. Islam has provided the solution. And there is a story I'd like to relate to you of an individual, an American, white American by the name of Sipes, who was raised in a family of white supremacists belonging to the Ku Klux Klan, famous, famous racist organization in America. And he talked about having joined that organization from he was 14 years till he was 21. And he became a high-ranking official in the Klan. It was involved in recruiting, etc., for it. And when he was asked about the reasons for his attitude, you know, towards black Americans, African Americans, he said, because that's what everybody in his family said. This is what he grew up with. They were always referring to black people as cockroaches, violent and bad, you know, and they were just uh, leeching off the white people. Eventually, he got involved in crime and ended up in jail. And while he was there, he had joined up with one of the racist groups in the jail because people polarize in jails, Aryan nation. And um, he, at that time, though he had joined with this group for his own self-protection, he had time to read. And he started to study about racism and race and people and their origins, etc. And he started to have some doubts about what he had been raised with. And the more he read, the more doubts he started to develop. Eventually, he came out of jail and he met some Muslims. He ended up being a roommate of a black who was also a Muslim. And um, through the behavior, how that person as a Muslim treated him, sharing with him whatever he had, and he just couldn't understand it, why he would be so forthcoming and so sharing, it eventually won him over and he became a Muslim. From a white supremacist belonging to the Ku Klux Klan, being opened by reading, of course. That's why Allah says in the Quran that these differences in color and tongues, etc., are from the greatness of Allah and have nothing to do with superiority or pride. This is clear to those who have knowledge. To those who have knowledge. A person without knowledge moves on emotion. So they can't change. Difficult to change when what you are reacting to is a product of emotion and not knowledge. 
And this is why from the Islamic perspective, back to the Quran again, we find in the Quran where Allah identifies there the beginning of racism. Where? In the creation of Adam. When Adam was created, the angels and Iblis, Satan, a leader among the jinn, were instructed to bow in recognition of Adam's special place with Allah. Iblis refused. Satan refused. And when he was questioned as to why, he said, Ana khairun minhu. I'm better than him, Adam. That man that you want me to bow before. I'm better than him because you created me from fire. The jinn are created from fire. And you created him from clay. That is that expression of racism. You see, there it is mentioned in the Quran as something evil which led to God's curse, God's eternal curse on Satan. Pride based on racial, tribal origin is a cursed state, displeasing and hated by God. Very precious. This life is a gift from Allah. Utilize this gift for here and hereafter. Enjoy this gift in the light of the Quran and Hadith. Enjoy Islam with us, Zain and Dawood. Enjoying Islam with Zain and Dawood tonight at 7:30 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 8:30 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Dialogue. Discussion, 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 debate, 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 rebuttal, rebuttal, rebuttal conclusion. conclusion. Eliminate misconceptions about religion. Get enlightened. Witness Dr. Zakir Naik in a battle of words in Crossfire every Friday at 8.30 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 9.30 p.m. UAE on Peace TV.